Welcome to the Love Lab Podcast, a safe place to get real about sex. Whether you're a man, woman, single, or couple, this is the show for you. We are your hosts, Kevin Anthony and Celine Remy, and we are here to guide you to go from good to amazing in the bedroom and beyond. All right, everybody, welcome back to the Love Lab Podcast. This is episode 103, and it's titled, How to Tell Someone You Have Herpes. Okay, I don't know why we waited so long to do an episode on this. I, I've lost count now how many stories from clients and friends that we have had dealing with this subject. And I'm always amazed at how much misinformation and outright bad information there is out there on this subject. You wrote a massive blog article a few years back with the help of uh, somebody um, who is very in the sort of health and research field. Um, So we got really great technical data in there. We're going to use some of that. We did some more research uh, to get some more current stuff. And then we're going to talk about our own friends and our own clients' um, experiences. It's going to be a packed show, and you are almost definitely going to learn something you didn't know. But first, let's start with a little disclosure. I am a herpes carrier. (gasps) I have HSV-1. What? I do. You're just telling me this now? (laughs) How about you tell our audience about yourself, Kevin? I don't know what you're talking about. (laughs) This is why we're doing this show, to like eradicate the stigma around herpes and the shame and the blame and the discomfort. Yes, so I I do have herpes 1 as well, which is the oral herpes. We're going to get into all the different versions of it um, coming up very, very soon. All right, so now that we got this out of the way, uh, okay, we have our piece, and you still love us. <laughs> well, uh, well, you know, we're in some pretty good company because wait till we get to the stats about just how many people actually have it. Yeah, <laughs> that's well, first we're going to go into what it is, and then we'll talk about how many people actually have it. Yeah, and we're going to give you also um, different remedies per se um, because there's no like you can't cure it um, but you can manage it we'll talk also about dealing when you have an outbreak and so many things so it's going to be a really good episode but before we start into diving into all the different types of herpes because there is more than one let's give a big shout out to our sponsor power and mastery if you want to join the secret club of men who are great in bed then check out power and mastery it is the most complete sexual mastery training for men and you can find more about it at powerandmastery.com. All right, let's dive in to the types. Okay, so most people have heard of type 1 and type 2, but did you know that there are actually eight types? Eight. I don't think most people realize that. You know, unless they've had one of those other things and then their doctor might have said, you know, that's actually a version of. But... Let's go through them. We'll spend the most time on types one and two, and then we'll go a little faster through the other six. Mm-hmm. So I want to start, too, with a little bit of um, what I've noticed when it comes to herpes. Some people put a little bit of a hierarchy or like one is better than the other, <laughs> which is really ridiculous. We're like, well, H- HSV1, uh, which is for herpes one, is better because it's kind of like the oral herpes. And HSV2 is the genital herpes, and that's worse. And somehow there's this kind of idea. Herpes is herpes. And oral can also be transmitted. We'll talk about more like can be given, like it can also show up in the genitals. It's not just on the mouth. So there's a lot of things and misunderstanding around that. Right. So it's basically the same thing. It just infects certain parts of the body and whether or not you got infected in one part or another really doesn't make a difference. So herpes one would be maybe the most known one uh people usually call it as oral herpes and what it happens is something that's very interesting is that it does not require fluids for transmission to happen and it is a skin to skin transmission 
So one can be contagious even when one doesn't have an outbreak. That means that you can spread the virus to other people as well as your own body. That's an interesting fact to know, right? Um, it means that if you're touching your lips, your nose, you can move it to a different area of your body. So keep these hands away from any outbreaks. Um, the prodromal phase, which is right before an outbreak, is the most contagious phase, which makes it difficult because when you are before the outbreak, there are really no signs. Even though we'll talk about maybe some subtleties once you know more about herpes and about your body, uh, but you are the most contagious when there's nothing showing. And so you need to know your symptoms well so you don't pass it to others. And so some of the signs is often you can feel a dryness in the area or a slight tingling sensation uh, before an outbreak shows up. So everyone is different. You need to pay attention to your body and what is happening for you, which means that uh, people who are new to having herpes tend to be more I want to say the term dangerous, it's kind of a weird term, uh, but in, in passing it on because they don't understand their body and their symptoms very well. Then somebody who's seasoned has been had it, like has had it for many years and then they know exactly the patterns. Um, and then one last thing around that is when you notice symptoms, you must boost your immune system, get extra sleep, refrain from having physical contact with others. Uh, and by that, just like if you have an oral uh, herpes, usually it's on the corner of your mouth and by the way it is different than a canker sore which is different um, then don't do anything related with your mouth there and don't have anyone touch you and don't touch yourself and then touch yourself yeah. or others we'll, we'll go much deeper into treatments and what you know alternative treatments and mainstream medical treatments and all that kind of stuff when we get further on in this episode so we're not going to focus too much on that as we talk about the different types we just want to go over what those types are and then we'll, we'll dive more into that kind of stuff so so basically type one is oral and it can be transmitted through lots of ways which you wouldn't even think about it you sure you shared a glass with somebody or or utensil spoon fork something like that a lip balm a lip balm yes I mean, so one of the stigmas that we would love to remove uh, definitely from the type one is that somehow you must have been doing something weird sexually with somebody. Or dirty. Or dirty. Yeah. Not true at all. You could have been hanging out with your friend. You're like, hey, can I have a sip of that? Whatever. You know, oh, you got a new drink. Let me mm -hmm. try some of that, you mm -hmm. know, and... And as a matter of fact, I was seeing in some of the articles from doing the research that most people have been exposed by the age of five to herpes uh, number one, the oral one. And so, you know, for me, I got herpes one and I remember having had one outbreak as a teenager having like on, on the side of my mouth. And I've never had it again, but now I test positive for it. And I had never kissed anyone. I hadn't had a boyfriend by then, you know. So I'm like, there is no way that this came from even being sexual. It was just from being human. <laughs> exactly. And, you know, I've gotten them for as long as I can remember, too. Mm -hmm. So there, there's no, there was never any point of like, oh, that person or anything like that. It's mm -hmm. just, yeah. All right, so let's move on to number two. Sure, tell us about number two, which is the herpes simplex, also known as, as the genital herpes. All right, well, it's herpes on your stuff. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just kidding. <laughs> All right, so since the 19, late 1970s, the number of Americans with a genital herpes infection has increased by 30%. Up to 1 million new general herpes, HSV2 infections may be transmitted each year in the United States. We're going to go more into the, um, the stats, the stats after bit. this. Mm -hmm. But basically, it spreads via skin-to-skin -skin contact and is most contagious when open sores are present. Beware as transmission can still occur without having a flare-up or visible sign. Mm -hmm. And that's kind of one of the big things here is... Again, maybe we should have done the stats in the beginning, but logically to me, it seemed better to talk about what is it first and then the stats. We'll but, go back into the stats. Yeah, but one of the things that is, that is, I guess, important, the reason why I thought about that right now in this moment, is that there doesn't have to be any sign whatsoever mm -hmm. that you have it for transmission to occur. And this is a common um, 
thing that we hear from clients and friends, which is, uh, you gave me, they'll say to their partner, you gave me herpes. And the partner is like, I've never had an outbreak in my life. I don't know what you're talking about. No, no, I know it had to have been from you, right? Mm -hmm. And then they go get tested. And sure enough, they actually do test positive because so many people do. Mm -hmm. Now, the question then always comes in, well, did you really get it from that person? Or did you also have it and not know it? Because so many people have it don't have symptoms, don't even know they have it. Mm -hmm. And it can be dormant for many, many years. Yeah. And then life stresses, situations awakens it. Um, one thing you need to really know about um, herpes too is that condoms do not guarantee full protection because they only cover a small area of the skin, right? And they tend to move, especially when you make love. Uh, while it's annoying, painful, especially uh, the first couple times you have a breakouts from what I've heard uh, it's not life-threatening it's really not a big deal and you can learn to manage it and so this whole like scarlet letter that people get when they like have genital herpes and go like oh my gosh like this is terrible it's going to be the end of my sex life it's not the case I also want to mention that oral herpes can show up on the genitals that you also let's say you have oral herpes you're giving oral sex it could show up on the genitals even though usually herpes 2 is on the genitals herpes 1 is on the the mouth it can be uh, one or the other so again this is why it's important to know your body knowing like kevin said if you're asymptomatic you could still be a carrier you can still shed and sometimes people just have the virus never have anything and sometimes it's dormant for many years and then it shows up okay so now let's go, we'll do a quick over. Yeah, a quick overview of some of the other types of uh, herpes that most people do not even know are herpes. So yeah. type three, also known as varicella zoster virus, which you may know a little bit better by the name chicken pox. Who hasn't had chicken pox? So you've already had a, a form of herpes when you've contracted this virus of chicken pox. You remember? It's like when it's really itchy, you have this oh, rush. Everybody oh. knows what the chicken pox yes. are. <laughs> Um, type 4 is called the Epstein-Barr virus, HHV4. Um, uh, the one that you maybe know as the kissing disease or the mononucleosis. <laughs> I survived it. <laughs> Uh, but that's fu that's funny. That happened at summer camp for me. <laughs> One year, somebody had uh, monocleosis and they were like, oh my gosh, the kissing disease. And it's the thing when you have hormones and you're a teenager, you hear about this. But nobody knows that it's actually a form of herpes, right? So I, I wanted to just go back for one split second to type three. Sure. Because we mentioned that it was chicken pox. Mm -hmm. But another thing that we didn't mention is that when you're much older and this gets reactivated. It it's can, called It's called shingles. shingles that's right? true. And the reason why it's important to give you all these names, because you, you've you heard of shingles, you know shingles, you know chicken pox, right? Mm -hmm. You know oral herpes, you know all these things, and you don't associate them with being a form of herpes. And so part of the, the uh, taking the stigma away is to get everybody to realize that these are all the same things and most people have had at least one version of one of these things. Absolutely. And it's not the end of the world when somebody's got like shingles, it may not look good and you're like, okay, well, good luck with that, right? You don't like think they're horrible persons. Well, and no, right? Because it also isn't um, associated in any way with sex. Mm -hmm. So the, the problem and where a lot of the stigma comes from is that you had sex with somebody who's dirty. But mm -hmm. nobody says that when like, you know, a 70 year old woman, you know, gets shingles. Like, <laughs> people are like, oh, you have shingles. <laughs> okay. <Absolutely>. You know, <laughs> no and nobody deal. thinks about that when a child gets chicken pox. In fact, it's like, hey, Johnny down the street's got chicken pox. So send all your kids over there so you can all get it. Because mm -hmm. actually, if you get that virus when you're an adult, it's much more dangerous than if you get it when mm -hmm. you're a kid. So it's actually better to have it when you're a kid. You probably all know that because you've probably all had it already. <laughs> um, 
So let's go, I want to finish our herpes so that we all have that, uh, we have a type 5, I'm going to go through the word here, cytomegalovirus. It's a strain of herpes that is a common one and it doesn't cause any symptoms in most healthy people. Uh, but if you have a compromised immune system, and that's the key, it's always a compromised him immune system, we'll go back to that later, uh, it can lead to severe complication. But again, that's another form of herpes in the type 5. Now there's type 6 and 7, they called herpes virus 6 and 7. How fancy, right? Mm. And uh, these strains usually occur in childhood and cause a roseola infantum. It's that mild infection that creates high fever and a rash. So a lot of, of infants have had that too. And then the last type of her herpes, because there are eight types, is the type 8. And this one is called caposarcoma, and it's associated with um, the herpes virus HHV8. And that is the one that uh, this strain of the virus can lead to cancer where patches of abnormal tissue grow under the skin and in the lining of the mouth, the nose, the throat and lymph nodes or other organs. So again, like this is like a more severe, but that's a form of herpes too at a start. So you've got eight type of herpes. So why would we demonize two of them and be okay with the six other, right? <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Hence the point of all of this. <laughs> Okay, so now you understand the different types and that there are many different mm -hmm. types and that you have most likely had at least one, maybe two, possibly even three different types mm -hmm. of this. Um, let's talk about just how prevalent this is. So first I went to the CDC, found some good stats there. Then I also found a site called justherpes.com, grabbed some stats from there. So how common is oral herpes, the HSV-1? Okay, so roughly, and it depends where you get the stats from, but 50 to 80% of Americans have this. It's now, the biggest club in the world. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> yep. This one says 50 to 80. What I've seen in previous research is most people will quote the 80. Yes, absolutely. The 80% number. Mm -hmm. Yes. Um, and then about 50% of new genital herpes infections in women are actually caused by oral herpes. So that's somebody that has the oral herpes giving oral sex to somebody and then transmitting it that way. So but think about that. 80% of people in America, and I'm willing to bet that in other countries, it's at least that high, mm -hmm. maybe even higher. What's interesting is that they've actually stopped testing for herpes. Uh, when you go do your STIs uh, for sexually transmitted infections, unless you specifically ask to have a full panel that will include herpes, they don't do it. Yeah, you know why? Because pretty much everyone has it. So yeah, it's a that's, waste. that's actually their reasoning for not testing. They say we don't test for it because everybody tests positive. So what's the point, right? And <laughs> what they're saying, they will test if you have a rash or something that shows up just because so then you know that it's not something different, you know. Uh, but what they say is, well, so many people are asymptomatic anyway. And then it creates more trauma to have to deal with the stigma of knowing your carrier. Which I'm like is not a good reason in my no, opinion. No, no, that's, that's a BS excuse. Absolutely. But that's some of the reasons. So unless you've specifically asked to be tested for herpes, you may not know. And you may be a carrier. You may have been for many years without knowing it. So when you go get an STI, which we'll talk more in detail again later, um, it's important to know what's going on in your body because then you can't blame your partner because you might already have been a, a carrier. Yeah, absolutely. So let's talk about type 2 mm -hmm. now. This particular stat comes from uh, the website I mentioned above uh, the Just, Just Herpes. Herpes. But mm -hmm. I also confirmed these stats on the CDC website as well. So they say about 1 out of 6 people in the United States has genital herpes, the mm -hmm. genital version. So... Uh, this article was actually written in 2018, so numbers may have changed a little bit, but basically that's about 55 million people. Wow. 55 million people. Yeah, that, so it's a pretty big club. It is, so really not a big deal. All right, right? but here is the big kicker of a stat. 
87 to 90 percent of people with genital herpes don't know they have it that bears repeating yes 87 to 90 (laughs) percent of the people who have genital herpes do not know they have it that's crazy that's so, crazy. so we said there's 55 million people that have it according to these numbers. That means 48 million of them don't know they have it. Wow. That's huge. So um, then they blissfully going on around in their life, maybe shaming others, not knowing that they too have it. Right. So they say that this is the second most prevalent uh, STD after HPV. We're not going to touch HPV now, right? We need to do a whole episode on that too. That's a whole can of worms. It is a <laughs> can of fucking worms. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> in my opinion, I think it's the most prevalent STD. Yes, yes absolutely. And so knowing that, I mean, like again, we hear all about like making this more normal opening up a conversation, now realizing that a lot of people are holding back, disclosing the information because they're thinking their friends won't accept them, their partner will not. And once, you know, you carry this weight and once you realize that you're just not like, you're one in a, not one in a million, you're part of millions of people having this, like it's not a big deal. Okay, I got one more stat Mm -hmm. for y'all. And this one is Probably also going to blow your mind. And I'll tell you, well, I'll tell you after I read the stat why I think it might blow your mind. How many men versus women have genital herpes? So according to, this is again coming from justherpes.com, about 23.5% of women have genital herpes caused by HSV2. And about 11.5% of men have genital herpes. Now, Here's the reason why I bring this up. And there's actually a good explanation for this, which I'll give you in just a moment. The reason why I thought this was important to to bring up is not to shame women in any way, shape, or form. But the majority of the stories or the cases that we hear are the woman saying to the man, you gave me herpes. You must have cheated. I know three people Mm -hmm. just off the top of my head who have said he gave it to me Mm -hmm. now knowing how many people have it and don't know they have it and the fact that it can lie dormant for very many years Mm -hmm. yes he may have given it to you and it's entirely possible that you already had it didn't know you had it and now for whatever reason, whatever is happening in your life, it's actually starting to come out, flare up, whatever it is. Mm-hmm. So, okay, why do we see a higher percentage of women than men, right? Because men and women are both having sex together. You would expect a fairly similar result. result. <laughs> <Outcome. laughs> and it's, it's just because the female genitals are more susceptible to infection due to their exposed soft tissue. Mm-hmm. That's the only reason why. So it's not like women are dirtier than men or anything like that. Mm-hmm. But you do see a higher infection rate in women, which means that they would then be technically most likely passing that on at a higher rate too, since there's simply more of them with it. Mm-hmm. Um, so, you know, one of the things that we always say, when because, you know, clients come to us and they are literally like mortified, terrified mm-hmm just be they don't know what to do they look at their partner like they just gave them a death sentence i mean it really sometimes it really gets that bad Mm -hmm. and so it's important to understand how this works and what these numbers are Mm -hmm. and one of our pieces of advice always are like okay have you ever been tested They always say no. Mm -hmm. Okay, well, then you don't know if you had it or not already. Mm -hmm. You know, has he ever been tested? Most times they say no also. Well, okay, well, then we can't really lay blame here. If if neither of you have been tested, neither of you had symptoms before, now you suddenly have symptoms, you both get tested and you both have it, there's no way to know who gave it to who. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And here's the thing. When you engage in sexual activities, you always are at risk to uh, have something. But anytime you interact with another human being, it's it's called being part of being a human. And I think the 
um, benefits way outweigh the risks, in my opinion, but you also got to play smart. So we are going to talk to you about how long it takes to be detected, things to do, uh, symptoms. Uh, but before that, I uh, would like to, in, to invite you into our Platinum program. So are you a committed couple who is stuck in a rut and just going through the daily motions instead of connecting the way you used to? Are you tired of stale mechanical sex that lacks spontaneity and fun and you just don't want to live a life of average? Then, if you've answered yes, we'd like to invite you to join our ultimate highly sex power couple relationship synergy platinum program. Ooh, I said it. So give us 90 days and we will help you bring the passion back between the sheets and be synced up sexually so that you can thrive with more purpose and passion in life. You can find more about our program at celineremy.com forward slash passion. All right. So we were just talking about sort of, you know, the stats of who has it who doesn't have it, how many people know they have it versus don't know they have it. Another interesting thing that sometimes comes up when people come to us with this issue is they have sex with somebody, they have a breakout the next day or two days later, and they instantly go, I knew it, you gave it to me, mm -hmm. right? Okay, we need, to, we need to understand incubation periods here. So the incubation period for herpes is about 2 to 12 days, so it's pretty short. So what that means is that the best time to get tested for the herpes virus, if you haven't had any, uh, like an initial outbreak, is after 12 days after you've been exposed. So if you're worried that you've been exposed, then wait 12 days and go get a test. In general, it takes anywhere from 4 to 7 days for the herpes symptoms to appear. And so both genital and oral herpes outbreaks have similar symptoms. So technically, it won't be like you have sex with somebody and the next day you have something. It doesn't happen like this. And that's why it was so important to put this piece in here mm -hmm. because we have literally heard that from people. Mm -hmm. Like, boom, oh, I, we had sex and then boom. And it's like, eh, this is most likely one of those cases where you already had it. Mm -hmm. Probably what happened is you felt some sort of guilt about having sex with this person that you just met or whatever it mm -hmm. is. And you stressed yourself out and caused an outbreak mm -hmm. <laughs> of something you already had, mm -hmm. most likely. And so it's important to understand that. The other thing is, is that, you know, if you have unprotected sex with somebody and then like three days later, it comes out they have herpes and now you're freaking out about it and you run straight to get a test. Well, it doesn't really, mm -hmm. the, the results might come back negative. You go, oh, whew, great. Mm -hmm. That doesn't necessarily mean anything because you really have to wait. Like I would say, if you think you've been infected, wait a solid two weeks mm -hmm. and then go get tested. Absolutely. So I want to talk about different treatments and we're going to give you different things that you can do. Um, I want to say that I want to I want to say one thing like okay I want to talk about when herpes tends to show up before I give you the treatments okay what what are things that exacerbs herpes like when you have severe stress is one thing when you have exposure to cold weather or sunlight that can also create uh, an outbreak they're saying after a tooth extraction interestingly enough I think it's because it, you know if you've ever had a tooth extraction, you know how much stress it causes on your body, right? So again, I think it's more stress related than anything else. If you have hormones fluctuations, such as pregnancy, menstruation, and also like maybe menopause too, when your hormones go all the way out like this, if you have a fever, and if you have other infections in the body that are present. So again, it's about the terrain, it's about your body. If your body is stressed out is weaker there is a chance for herpes to flare up more often okay now let's look at treatments let's start with a self-care treatment and the self-care treatment is more something that you do not really when you have the outbreaks, but kind of in between to keep the immune system strong and things like that so there are antiviral herbs like the red marine algae um, lomatium and olive leaf that you can take. I've done those and they worked really well. And then you want to think about boosting your immune system with things like vitamin D, zinc, and lysine. 
that's for the self-care. You could still use that too when you have an outbreak, but you can use this as a, um, like a free month cure per se. Like, uh, not that it's going to make it disappear. Once herpes virus is in your blood, it usually stays in your blood forever, even though there are some cases, but medical mainstream will say uh, you can, can't get rid of it. Yeah, okay. they, they say it's completely incurable. Mm -hmm. You know, so I also want to say with the with the self care stuff, there are a lot of natural things that you mm -hmm. can use that actually work, in my opinion, better than the medications. Mm -hmm. Now, of course, doctors are never going to tell you that, um, but there are a lot of things that you can do. A lot of, um, for instance, there's numerous essential oils mm -hmm. that have very strong antiviral properties to them. Mm -hmm. um, so that's that's a good thing. Then you know. Some of this stuff is preventative as well, right? So mm -hmm. keep your immune system strong. If you keep your immune system strong, then you're not going to have any mm -hmm. outbreaks. So that's the first thing. Um, as you mentioned, vitamin D, vitamin C, which is not actually on the list here. Zinc, lysine is a big one. What a lot of people don't know is that um, the virus actually needs arginine. Mm -hmm. um, arginine is found in uh, certain foods like nuts. nuts. Mm -hmm. uh, there's more than just nuts. I, I'm not remembering off the top of my head, but there's a bunch of foods that have sort of high uh, arginine content. So you want to avoid those things. So on a, for like a maintenance kind of a thing, just be careful of how much food you eat that has a ton mm -hmm. of arginine in it. When you have an outbreak, try to avoid those foods altogether. Yes. And then for maintenance, lysine actually counteracts that mm -hmm. so foods that are high in lysine these are all just amino acids is all they are so foods that are high in lysine and there's a bunch of those things it tends to be like you know meats dairies eggs i think even avocados things like that that mm -hmm. are relatively high in in lysine so you want to eat more of those and then especially when you have an outbreak focus eating more of those things than the other stuff like i said there's a whole bunch of essential oils Mm -hmm. There are whole products out there made that are just combinations of essential oils. Um, there's a whole bunch of other things. I don't want to actually go too deep into mm -hmm. them because we'll probably get in trouble for, for saying them. <laughs> I want to mention but they work. that it's also a message from your body that you probably are, are too stressed out, that something's going on, that you need to slow down. And I'm going to use Kevin as an example before we give you uh, the rest of the treatments because you used to have way more flare-ups um, in your previous relationship. And in our relationship, I think it happened once, yeah, in maybe. four and a half years, maybe twice. Maybe twice. But the difference is that your previous relationship was pretty stressful. That is correct. And <laughs> my theory is really that the more out of balance, whether it's emotionally stressful or physical stress, the more the weaker you become and the more the body can flare up with things like that. Well, that's what they call stress the silent killer. Mm -hmm. It creates all kinds of problems. But the biggest thing is, is it weakens your immune system. Mm -hmm. Some people choose to do the medical care uh, for their treatments. Really, the options are like uh, antiviral medications. I'm not a big proponent of this. Some people just do it because they're just too afraid of having a flare-up. I mean, it's your body. You do what you want. But know that all these medications have side effects. They come with other stuff. Yeah, and you know, here's what I would say about that. There's there's a couple different kinds. There's medication you can take when you have a flare up. Mm -hmm. Then there's medication you can take to prevent you from having one. From having a breakout, yes. So, through my own personal experience of using multiple different things, <laughs> I can honestly say that the natural stuff works better. Mm. Actually, works better than the medication. But here is a place where medication sometimes is necessary i have seen some people that have constant constant flare-ups just over and over again and for those types of people the medication that that basically prevents the flare-ups mm -hmm. gives them their life back yes now Honestly, what they really need to do is get their body healthy mm -hmm. and get their body in balance. Mm -hmm. And then those flare-ups will go away. But in the meantime, while they're working on that, some of the people that have really continual, really intense flare-ups, the medication can be very helpful mm 
mm-hmm. in those situations. So you probably have heard of them. I mean, we're not going to go in details. We're just going to give you the name. Like acyclovir is a very popular one. And then there's the famcyclovir or famvir and the valacyclovir, valtrex. So they're all kind of the same family here. Uh, that's something you get for your doctor. I want to briefly touch on integrative medicine uh, to add a few things. Some people have had really good results with intravenous ozone therapy high dose intravenous vitamin c and high dose of colloidal silver these are controversial um, and at the same time they work very well some you know in the united states they're controversial in other countries they like the things that people do and they work and they're supported so you have to do your own research uh, but these things can help okay so yes they are considered controversial here in the u.s and i personally know multiple people who have used these treatments successfully. I've known of one person who said they got rid of it. And that's why I said mainstream media says you don't. But one person did the intravenous treatment and they said they don't have the virus in the blood again. So, so what that means is the level is so low it's not detectable in the mm-hmm. test. And does it mean it's a 100% gone? I don't know. We don't know. Yeah. But... They literally were able to reduce it to a level that is not detectable by the test. So this should give you hope. A lot of different options. Uh, make sure you listen again to this, to the different things uh, so that you can make a list. Yeah, and then and so take these ideas. So there's mm-hmm. intravenous ozone therapy. I'll just say them one more time again. There's high-dose intravenous vitamin C and high-dose colloidal silver. Um, actually, there is a, a intravenous colloidal silver uh, treatment as well. Mm-hmm. Um, just go research them on your own. We're not really going to tell you any more about mm-hmm. that, but just know that I personally know multiple people who've done several of these different several rounds, ones, yes, um, and have had great success with it. So just go research it for yourself if you're mm-hmm. if you're interested. So I want to quickly talk about preventing the spread of herpes. So some of the ways, first, how do you prevent it is to understand how it spreads, right? So most uh, for HSV1, usually it's for kissing someone on the mouth, sharing utensils or a cup, a lip balm, performing oral sex. These are activities that can transmit the virus. If if it's HSV2, oral sex, vaginal sex, and anal sex will transmit it or are... Uh, a a, a big potential. So now that you understand that these are the things that spread the virus, when you want to start to uh, prevent it, then you need to avoid these activities for a little while, right? (laughs) (laughs) Not forever, but just when you have an outbreak. And understand that once the outbreak is out, the worst is already behind. I mean, it sucks, especially if it's on your face because it's on your face and everybody can see it. But you actually were more contagious before the flare before it came out, right? And so you just know to have to wait 10 to 14 days until it totally disappears and heals. And then you can go back to your regular activities of oral sex and kissing and drinking, sharing drinks and all of this with other people. I mean, it's not a big deal. A couple of weeks break. <laughs> And then I know you had different things you wanted to say, like how to avoid yeah. exposure. We want to tell like the things to do, really. Okay, so here's the thing. Again, we hear these stories from clients and from personal friends. Mm-hmm. I mean, we just heard another one like, what, a week ago? Mm-hmm. I mean, it, it happens pretty regularly. And here's the thing. The most recent one that we heard could have absolutely been prevented. Mm-hmm. If they just took a couple of basic steps. And so I thought, you know, it'd be pretty important to share those, mm-hmm. right? Because, yeah, it's great to know what it is and to recognize it and to know how to treat it. But wouldn't it be great if you never got it to begin <laughs> with? I think so. Yeah, but since, you know, 80% of the people have it, that's why we took so much time telling you yeah. about how to deal with it once you have it. And that's for the 20% of you who don't have it. We're going to give you these few tips. Yeah. <laughs> the or, last two minutes are for you. <laughs> or maybe you have one but not the other and you'd like to not have both. Some people say yeah. that when you have one, you're more resistant to having the other one. And at the same time, I know plenty of people who've got both. So it's not, it's kind of a myth to say yeah. if I have one, I'm like, I'm like protected forever. So... Just be aware. So here's the thing. In the majority of cases that that come our way, that we hear of, the people meet somebody, they never have the conversation about safe sex. We have a whole episode on how to have safe sex. So go back to this episode if you don't know how to make it work. Right. And that conversation isn't just like, oh, what birth control do we use or what STD prevention? It's literally going over your history. Here's 
what I have or what I had. Here's what I've done. Here's what I do. What here are my protocols? All of that stuff. So basically, it's like playing Russian roulette because you have no idea what the person's history is if mm -hmm. you never have that conversation. That conversation happens before, before you have sex. Hello, before you even touch each other's genitals. I actually say sometimes, have it before you even start kissing and exchanging fluids. Have that at the beginning. Understand each other. Is it worth taking a chance and a risk with that person? Exactly. The next is, you know, a lot of times if you have that conversation and most people have never been tested, uh -huh. then simply ask them to get tested. It's not a big deal. Like most cities will have their, their uh, county health department or whatever where you can go for a super low cost mm -hmm. and get this test done. And you can specifically request to be tested for herpes along with all the other things. Mm -hmm. It's really like, honestly, I know so many people that do like the online dating stuff, you know, and they're constantly dating and having random casual sex with different people. They call themselves monogamous, but you know, I'm like, wow, how many people have you had sex with in the last year? Mm -hmm. They don't have this conversation with anybody. Half the time they don't even use condoms or practice safe sex. And they think, oh, I mean, uh, no big deal, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, it's not like I'm one of those weird poly swinger people kind of thing. But honestly, their behavior is actually more dangerous. And I want to say the term they always use, I'm clean. By the way, stop associating cleanliness with STIs because it's yeah. not that you're dirty if you have something or you're clean if you don't have something. It's more about like, do you know what's going on, you know? It's just, is it clear, not clean? <laughs> yeah. That's a very important distinction. And, and then the last thing is, okay, so we covered that condoms don't 100% prevent you from getting herpes. That is absolutely true. That They can reduce the mm -hmm. possibility that you get it. So it's like you meet somebody new, have a conversation. If you don't like the answers you're getting in the conversation or you're not sure what the answers are, then simply go get tested. And just use some basic, you know, protection, mm -hmm. condoms, male condoms, female condoms, whatever it is, maybe not uh, engage in oral sex just yet, right? Like just those simple protocols alone would have prevented at least the last three cases mm -hmm. of people that told me that they just got herpes. And then stop having sex in the dark. Like, turn on the light and look at each other's genitalia. If there's anything suspect, anything, or if you feel slightly itchy. I mean, if Kevin and I are married, and it's like, well, whatever I've got, you've got, whatever he's got, I've got. But it's like, if I have something that feels slightly off or weird, he's the first person to know. And we, like, take an informed decision. Should we have penetration? Should we use a condom? Should we take a break and so if you see a little red pimple has a little rash or feel itchy or something's different or a smell is different i had that with another lover it was the smell that was different listen to your intuition it's okay to just say you know what i'm not quite sure that it's totally safe right now let's connect in different ways but look at each other's genitals like take a visual of thing especially at the beginning yeah, that's a good one. And, and I'm often surprised how many people don't actually look. <sighs> yeah. Especially when they're not even using protection. They're just uh -huh. like, oh, stick that in blindly. Like, <laughs> what? <laughs> what? No. You don't look at it first? <laughs> you don't smell it, taste it, feel it, look at it. I mean, come on. Like, if you do that, then, then you can see a lot of things that are different. And then let's be real. When you are with a new partner, even if you don't like condoms, even if like the lovemaking isn't as great with condoms because you can't feel the same or blah, 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 whatever excuse you're using, for the first few months or weeks at least until you've decided to be like um, monogamous or like really having all the rules laid out on how you're going to play if you are in an open relationship and know your safe sex, just be safe and use condoms for a little bit of time until you have all your test results and know the behavior of the other person. Because you know what? Two months of using condoms is a really small price to pay the having to deal with having herpes that you didn't have then and then having it for the rest of your life. You know, just basic precautions go a long way. <laughs> so, all right. And you know what? This episode, 
has gone a long <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> I want to say, remember, you've got herpes. It's not a big deal. Be upfront. Be honest. Love yourself. Take like, good care of your health and take breaks when there's an out- outbreak. And it's okay. You can still have sex. You are still beautiful. You are still sexy. You can still have pleasure. You are worthy of it all. And if somebody walks away, they just were not for you. Be strong and know that it has nothing to do with them. It has everything to do do with who they are so love yourself fully herpes or no herpes absolutely all right we did our best to cram as much as we could into this there are tons of resources out there if you have more questions of course you can ask us you can also go and do more research there's tons of it out there all right everybody that's all the time we have for this episode and we will see you next week We hope you like this episode of the Love Lab podcast. If you enjoy this show, subscribe, leave us a review, and share it with your friends. And for more free, exclusive content, join us in the Passion Vault at CelineRemy.com forward slash vault. That's C-E-L-I-N-E-R-E-M-Y dot com forward slash vault. Thanks for listening. And remember, you're amazing. <laughs>